o'clock. And uh, I do want to call this meeting to order. Ada, would you please read the public notice? Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, commissioners. Adequate public notice has been given pursuant to the Open Public Meeting Act. Notice has been posted at the board's office and website, emailed to the Department of State and to newspapers of broad circulation within the state. Uh, thank you, Ada. And before you take roll call, I just want to mention the fact that I heard through the grapevine uh, that Commissioner Gordon will be joining us late. Um, so if you would take roll call, please. Commissioner Holton? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Here. Commissioner Shivakula? Here. President Fiorliso? Here. I want to first of all thank everyone for joining us this morning and what uh, is our first quarterly public uh, comment meeting. And uh, we're very excited about it. And we really feel that it affords an opportunity uh, to increase the level of transparency uh, between the board and the public on important issues of public interest and to give members of the public an opportunity to speak directly to board commissioners. As you know, uh, the Board of Public Utilities is a quasi-judicial uh, entity, uh, which is, is run really by very strict ethical rules and so on, almost like a court of law in many instances, and sometimes we're a legislative body. But in, in, in the uh, judicial area, we're limited in what we can do and limited in what we can make public until the board actually acts on it. So uh, these quarterly meetings will hopefully give folks an opportunity since they do not have the uh, opportunity at a regular board meeting to uh, discuss certain issues. And, and we'll have topics uh, as we have today uh, that uh, folks can speak to and, uh, and then give us information because we always want to hear what is happening on the ground. We always want to hear what you are uh, experiencing because we learn from that, just as the utilities learn from that. So it, it's important for your participation. Today, we will be hearing from you on our state utilities recovery from the tropical storm in August where 1.4 million people lost power. We provided our assessments of the utilities recovery in, November, in a November report in which we identified certain issues that should be addressed and potential areas for improvement. And we wanna hear from you if you agree with those assessments, if you have additional recommendations. These include advanced metering infrastructure or smart meters, taking care of overgrown vegetation, and improving communications with customers and local elected officials. I know how it feels as a former mayor when a constituent calls and you kind of throw up your hands because you don't know the answer to a question. No elected official really wants to be put in the position where they don't know. So um, that kind of communication is necessary. That kind of communication is warranted particularly in situations where we have so many outages. Also included in the report were recommendations for utilities to further refine their preparation and response protocols for the next storm. And you can rest assured we're gonna have a next storm and a next storm and a next storm. Uh, tracking and valuing uh, infrastructure hardening and resilience projects, which we have been working toward and enhancing ever since Superstorm Sandy. The board has already taken action on uh, recommendations. For example, on smart meters, we recently approved a proposed a proposal from PSE&G to install smart meters for all of its customers. We also continue to engage with all of our utilities on the issue of vegetation management that tree comes down or that branch comes down and hits a wire, we have a lot of people out. 
we have heard from the utilities and from local officials. And we are here today to hear directly from residents and other stakeholders and local officials who are affected by the storm. I look forward to your suggestions to help us make your lives just a little bit better. And let me revise that by saying to make all of our lives a little bit better because we wind up in the same uh, situation that you do and your, and your constituents do uh, without power and so on. I look forward to your suggestions to help all of our lives look better. Uh, do any other commissioners wish to make any opening remarks? I am joined here today with my colleagues, Commissioner Holden, Commissioner Solomon, uh, Commissioner Shivakula, and as I indicated, Commissioner J Gordon will join us later on. Some logistical information. So you are all aware only the pre-registered speakers will have the ability to speak and ask questions. And the registration ended a week ago today. We will not have chat feature enabled and cannot accommodate anyone who didn't register or speak before the deadline. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're shut out. Any member of the public who did not register will be able to uh, watch via the live stream on YouTube, just like we have for our regular board agenda meetings. If anyone who did not register wishes to submit comments after the meeting, they may do so via the board secretary at board.com at bpu.nj.gov. Now I would suggest that you do it via email as opposed to sending something through the postal service. Uh, as you know, like many, many businesses, we're primarily working remotely. So in order to assess your comments in written form timely, on a timely basis, please use the email uh, um, venue. And again, it's board.secretary at bpu.nj.gov. And that's going to bring us to the uh, public comment period. And our uh, board- Mr. Pres uh, Mr. President, I'm sorry, I missed my turn. I wanted to- uh, uh, echo your comments, sentiments, and comments about the public portion and uh, having this type of interaction with the public uh, is uh, going to be quite fruitful. And uh, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have restrictions, as you said, because we are a quasi-judicial body and we, have, we cannot discuss the documented matters because of the ex parte communications. I think, uh, but we can talk about uh, policy issues. We can take the uh, feedback and uh, suggestions from the public. I think uh, it's a great start for 2021. I want to thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. Um, our board secretary, uh, Ada Camacho Welch, will be reading off the list of speakers as we go down. And when she reads your name, um, please uh, start your dissertation. Uh, and we do. This is being recorded. So we do have a court reporter who is uh, taking minutes of, of this meeting. So it would be helpful uh, for the court reporter if you would also spell your name and indicate the affiliation you have, if any. Ada, I'm gonna pass it to you now. And speak slowly. <laughs> Thank you, for Mr. President. For carry a big stick. Oh no, that's, I, I got it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to call upon Franklin Township Environmental Commission member, Robin Sedane. I don't see their name on the list here. Mr. Sedane, are you with us yet? Shall I move on? Yes, please. I would like to call upon East Amwell Mayor, Richard Wolf, Please state your full name for the record. Uh, my full name is Richard, R-I-C-H-A-R-D, Wolf, 
W-O-L-F-E. Uh, as you noted, I am the mayor of East Stanwell Township, about to start my third term as mayor. I'm also a member of our township committee, planning board, farmland and open space preservation committee and recycling committee. Uh, mayor, uh, yes, I, I just wanted, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I don't wanna to forget to mention uh, the fact that you did send us a letter and we appreciate that. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're all on the same page with uh, what you wrote in your letter. So I wanted to thank you for communicating with us. Well, and I'd like to thank you for actually paying attention to my letter because as I reviewed your November report, it became very clear to me that I did not waste my time writing the nine page letter. Uh, and I greatly appreciate uh, that you did pay attention to the letter. Um, I'm gonna follow the advice that I give to others when I say that the best presentations tend to have one thing in common, they're short. Uh, and while I could talk about a host of things today, I'm really gonna limit my discussion to two items. Um, my discussion today is going to focus solely on East Amwell and solely on the major power outage that was caused by the August tropical storm. And I'm also going to focus solely on JCPNL because they are the primary provider of electricity in East Amwell. And when I say primary, virtually all of our residents are JCPNL customers. And I'm looking to address two issues today. The first being JCPNL's poor communications, both with, both with its customers and with the elected officials. And second, I'd like to talk about JCPNL's poor management of the August power outage. I'm gonna give you a brief summary, background summary, and then I'm gonna ask the board two questions. Uh, the November BPU report states, and I quote, staff heard the greatest number of complaints about communication issues from JCPNL customers and elected officials. The report then goes on to cite a number of examples. The report then makes three recommendations that are relevant to this issue, at least from East Amwell's perspective. The first, which is your recommendation number one, is that the staff recommends the board direct the EDCs improve the ETRs automatically generated by their outage management system, and in particular to test the OMS under stressed conditions. Staff recommends that each utility file a plan to improve the accuracy of the ETRs in order to provide more reliable information for elected officials and customers. Recommendation number five, staff recommends the board direct the EDCs to develop a plan that proactively educates customers and elected officials on the restoration process. The plan should be completed within 90 days and address how customers and elected officials will be, will be informed while restoration is ongoing. And then finally, recommendation number six, which is directed solely at JCPNL. Staff recommends the board direct JCPNL to establish a process of communicating with elected officials and providing situational awareness about real time restoration activities in their community. This process should include, but not be limited to, major restoration work any staging area activity, concerns regarding critical community needs, and road closure issues. Next, I'd like to give a little bit of background about poor management. And by the way, I agree with the three recommendations. I strongly agree with the three recommendations I just read. Poor management. In my letter to the BPU, I stated the following. JCPNL was very disorganized in its handling of virtually all aspect of the restoration of power in East Amwell in the days following Isaias. This disorganization invariably led to significant delays in restoring power to the residents of East Amwell. 
I gave several examples. One, JCPNL did a poor job in identifying the location of outages. Neighborhoods that had power were shown on JCPNL's outage map and on our representatives list as not having power. Conversely, neighborhoods that were without power were shown as having no problems. In fact, with respect to two neighborhoods, I called our JCPNL representative, the representative that is available to the mayors, to tell him that we had two neighborhoods that were without power and were not shown as such on their outage map. And he is insisting that they have power. And in one case, I ran past the neighborhood about an hour before I called him and there were multiple generators running. So not only was I getting emails from the residents, but I physically saw the generator or heard the generators running. And he's telling me, no, there are no problems in these neighborhoods. Second, the repair crews and tree cutting crews were sitting idle in their trucks for hours waiting to be dis dispatched by JCPNL. How do we know they were waiting to be dispatched? Because the residents would ask them, why are you sitting here? And the crews would say, we're waiting to be dispatched. This wasn't one or two isolated incidents. I received numerous emails from residents telling me such. Three, the repair crews were wandering East Amwell aimlessly trying to find particular roads or the location of damage. I recognize that JCPNL brought into East Amwell repair crews from outside the area. But with the technology that we have today, I can't for the life of me understand why repair crews are driving around trying to find roads. On our cars, we can punch in an address. On our phones, we can punch in an address. And it will show you, it will take you to where you need to go. Finally, and perhaps most disturbingly from a public safety perspective, live down power lines were not deactivated for days. In one case, four days. The crew that came out to deal with that down power line told a resident that they were amazed that a live line was left down, not deactivated for four days. So with that bit of background, I'm going to pose two questions. Uh, and then after I pose them, if you choose to answer them uh, in this Zoom meeting, um, I, I defer to you. I don't know what constraints you have in responding to these questions, but I'd like to pose them. First, we all know that for years, JCPNL has had communications problems. This is not something unique to the tropical storm in August. My wife and I have been JCPNL customers since 1999. And every time there's a major storm or a major outage, I should say, and even when there are not major outages, but material outages, there are significant communications problems. And every time this has been raised with JCPNL, the response is always the same. It's a glitch in our technology. Well, when are they going to fix that glitch? I haven't seen any improvement at all since August. We continue to have the same problems when we have power outages. So what I'd like to know is what the BPU is going to do to force JCPNL to address this issue. They're not addressing it voluntarily and something needs to be done both from the perspective of the customers and the elected officials. Second, uh, the BPU report, the November report, did not address at all the poor management exhibited by JCPNL during ESIAS. And I would like to know, does that mean that the BPU believes that JCPNL is handling these major power outages efficiently? Now the report does note that in ESIAS, JCPNL restored all of its customers within seven days 
in New Jersey, whereas in Sandy, it took JCPNL 14 days to restore all of its customers. And perhaps the implication was that JCPNL has become more efficient since Sandy. That to me is not a good comparison or a basis for concluding that JCPNL has become more efficient because I can tell you in East Amwell, the damage that, done, that was done by Sandy was many, many times worse than what was done by Isaias. And I know that because I run six days a week, anywhere from an hour to three hours. I went out running the day after Sandy. I saw the damage. I went out running after Isaias, I saw the damage. There was no comparison. I also discussed it with our DPW supervisor who agreed that there was no comparison between the two. So the fact that JCPNL completed its restoration efforts in seven days in Isaias, whereas it was 14 days in Sandy, in my view, does not mean that they operated more efficiently. So just to repeat my two questions, first, I'd like to know what the BPU is going to do to force JCPNL to address the communication issue. And second, does the BPU believe that there are meaningful management inefficiencies in the way JCPNL is handling these major power outages? And with that, I, I am finished with my presentation and my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I, uh, the uh, president of JCPNL will be speaking later on and I'm going to allow him to answer those questions. But I do want you to know that uh, many uh, edicts have been put in orders uh, and, and approved by the board to uh, improve uh, resiliency and to improve the time period in which power is restored. We have conducted and continue to conduct management audits of the utilities uh, generally, and, uh, and then we order them to do certain things. Uh, and we stay on top of that, and uh, it is an ongoing process. We are not at the point where our, our system is universally resilient to the point we would like it to be, but we are working with the utilities and, uh, and we hope that that will continue to improve. But I'll let Mr. Fakel answer that question when it's his turn to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Ada? I would like to please note for the record that Commissioner Gordon has joined the meeting. Commissioner Gordon? I see him listed here on the. Um... He's muted. He's muted. Okay. Um, he is on the. Um... Okay. Why don't you continue? Okay. okay. I would like to call upon Millstone Township Committee Member Al Farrell. Please state your full name for the record. Well, good morning, everybody. Al Farrow, F is in Frank, E R R O, Committeeman, Millstone Township. Welcome, uh, Committeeman. Thank you for having me, uh, and good morning to everybody. Uh, I, I was going to uh, make a statement, and Mayor Wolf had uh, had already said a lot of the things I was going to say, so I will shorten uh, my my, uh, my statement. Uh, just like I would like to let the board know that because of Hurricane Isaias, uh, all of Millstone was out uh, without power. And the statement made that all residents in New Jersey were back with power within seven days is incorrect. Millstone residents uh, were in fact myself were out. I was out for nine days and our surrounding neighborhood was out for nine days and other parts of Millstone were, were out for as long as 13 days. Now, I don't know if you guys know Millstone, we're very rural and we are entirely on well and septic and to not have power is a major, major health and safety issue you know, for us. We have no water, 
no sewage, no, you know, cooking, no heat. I mean, there, there would be zero, uh, you know, habitable living conditions without power. That's how dependent we are on, on power. And to wait, you know, nine to 13 days for JCPNL to restore power is just not acceptable in, in this, you know, in this day and age, as Mayor Wolf had stated, with the technology that we have. Uh, like Mayor Wolf uh, said, we, I was called and, and I have numerous photos of residents taking pictures of crews just sitting there and not for 30 minutes or an hour, but again, as Mayor Wolf said, for hours, five, six, seven hours waiting and the residents got frustrated, like, why aren't you guys doing anything? And they said, we need to get our work release or work order in order to, to start the job. And unless they get that work order from JCPNL, they could not commence work. That's, that's a problem. You know, you're paying crews to sit there and you have people who are in dire need of the electrical power and to, to waste five, six, you know, seven hours because they didn't get the go ahead is just a, a failure in the system. Uh, with, with that said, we have a lot of elderly and, and single parent homes uh, that are more prone uh, during the winter months, uh, as opposed to the summer months, that there's a heat issue. And when, when the weather outside is extremely cold, the home gets cold very quickly. And, and that's a concern for us. So we would have to open up our community center and deploy you know, our DPW and, and try to reach out to these people to make sure that they're safe. And if they're not, then you know, we have to do what we have to do to protect our residents. And, and we bring whoever we need to bring to safety by bringing them to our community center or bring them water or provide, you know, if, if, if residents have generators or an extra generator, we, we try to, you know, help out each other and, and provide, you know, services that JCPNL should be providing to begin with. Now, every month, everybody gets a bill in the mail and every month we're required to pay it. And as such, you know, Millstone residents in, in particular, as well as every other municipality, uh, if you don't pay it because of services not being performed, then eventually that service will be cut off, even if that service is not being provided. So there's got to be a give and take here with, you know, the, the contractual issues. And, and I know it, it's regulated by, you know, state mandates and, and statutes and stuff, but there's got to be, again, like Mayor Wolf said, a better form of communication. I, I've reached out to uh, roughly 20 municipalities, uh, and I'm getting them together and I've spoken to a lot of different mayors, councilmen, uh, assembly men and women, and they're all on the same page that there is a breakdown of communication. There's a breakdown of response, especially with municipalities. You know, people are calling us with the phones off the hook because residents want to know what they should do. If, if they're gonna be out for a few hours, they can endure that. If they're going to be out for a few days, they know how to prepare for that. But if they're going to be out for an excessive period of time, that changes the entire game plan of what a family is going to be required to do to protect themselves. And if we as elected officials don't have that information or that's not being communicated to us properly, or, you know, again, like Mayor Wolf said, you know, they have in their grid people that have power and on other portions of their grid, they have people that don't have power, but it's the opposite. That's, that's really not acceptable because it, it further you know, causes issues for their response. So you know, moving forward, what, what I would like, and I had a whole list of questions to ask, and I, I don't think it, it would be proper at this time because I would be wasting your time because Mayor Wolf has already asked several of those questions. Uh, I've spoken to Upper Freehold, Manalapan Township, Atlantic Highlands, Hazlitt, Homedale, Aberdeen, Keyport, Robbinsville, Plumstead, New Providence. And I will reach out to Mayor Wolf uh, personally to speak to him as well and, and bring together a consortium of municipalities that we could collaborate and bring a directed response, a directed action plan from our point of view as, as elected officials, hearing all of the, the complaints that we have from our residents and ratepayers to this board and recommend, you know, viable milestones that should be implemented moving forward. 
And uh, again, echoing the last 10 years of, of how JC Pinnell ha has been handling things it is in the past. I would like to sit down with, with a power group. Uh, you know, I I'll, I'll volunteer my services, you know, if you'd like, and, and sit down with a member of, of your board, a member of JC Pinnell, uh, a member of maybe the, the Committee on Law and Safety, and sit down and come up with an action plan that have the members that, that can make decisions and, and enact change moving forward. Not pointing fingers at anybody, you know, it's just this is the state of affairs that we're in and there are flaws in the system that affect lives and affect the safety and health of residents. And it, it's not good that in 2021, we're even discussing this. We, we should be collaborating together and, and moving forward, not pointing fingers again at, at JCPNL, but working with them to come up with a better plan that will work and be mutually beneficial for both people. Uh, one of the plans that, that I've come up with and I've spoken to other mayors and councilmen is when we're responsible to redo our roads and the county is responsible to repave their roads in our towns, why not have a plan with JCPNL, Verizon, a Comcast and any other uh, company out there that has wiring that's exposed and when we dig up our roads, we have a coordinated plan with JCPNL and Verizon and everybody else to come in and maybe start an infrastructure improvement plan where they could put those you know, wires in conduits underground and saving the cost of the repaving and, and the relining of the roads because we're already gonna pay for that. And when, when you take 20 municipalities that have to do hundreds of miles of roads that could be hundreds of millions of dollars that JCPL can save and use that money to improve their infrastructure. So that, that could be a cost savings to them, but a major improvement to all of the municipalities and the residents in New Jersey. And I have a whole bunch of other ideas that I'd like to you know, sit down with key people and, and come up with, with a good action plan and, and move forward in a cohesive way so we all benefit from it. So with that said, I would like feedback from, from your board uh, to a power group that contains members that have positions of power and, and decision-making you know, abilities. So when we do come up with a plan and it's financially you know, viable and feasible and, and it works for both, then I would like to enact that. You know, with, with timelines, of course, that are realistic for both you know, JCPNL and, and, and New Jersey residents as well. So I would like to hear you know, from you you know, on how to move forward with this, what the timeline would be if you guys are acceptable to creating a power group. And uh, I'm just here to help and, and voice the concerns of, of many people, you know, especially Millstone Township residents and, and you know, a lot of other people in New Jersey. So it, it, it transcends just Monmouth County, it, it's New Jersey. And it, it seems to be anybody who has JCPNL is, is affected by this in, in a negative way. Uh, other other uh, utilities, when there's a power outage, they offer reimbursements to the residents. JCPNL does not. You know, a lot of people have extra refrigerators, and if they store food outside or inside, and there's power out, you know, for several days, that goes bad. That that's a direct loss to these people, to the ratepayers, with no reimbursement. So, uh, again, there would be a lot of you know questions that I have to ask you know, both the board and I would rather do that in a power group setting so we could actually achieve goals and, and make this better moving forward. So thank you for, you know, for the time and I appreciate you allowing me to be here. Thank you, uh, committee men. And I'm going to have uh, a fellow by the name of Chance Likens reach out to you and, and let's uh, uh, get this uh, quote power group organized and uh, see where it goes. I, I think you will find many of your questions are being addressed as we speak, but I think your idea of a power group is extremely uh, important and, and one that uh, we'd like to know more about. So I'm, I'm here to help. I'll volunteer my time. You let me know when and where. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Ada. I would like to call upon Atlantic Highlands Councilman John Crowley. Please state your full name for the record. Councilman, are you on mute, sir? I, 
don't see the councilman. All right, let's go to the next person, please. I would like to call upon Stephanie Brand, director of the New Jersey Division of Rate Council. Please state your full name for the record. Good morning, I'm Stephanie Brand and that's uh, Stephanie with an F and it's B-R-A-N-D. And as uh, the secretary mentioned, I am the director of the New Jersey Division of Rate Council. And the, for those of you who don't know about our office, we are charged by statute with representing all of the ratepayers of this state. And so we are involved in just about every case in, in, uh, in front of the Board of Public Utilities. And we have been involved in a lot of these issues for a very long time. We very much appreciate that the board is having this hearing. And it's very, um, very much appreciate the involvement of the public officials here today. I did submit my testimony this morning uh, to the secretary's office. I hope that she will distribute it to the commissioner. So I'm not gonna read it uh, today. I'm gonna spare you that. But I do wanna um, give you the highlights because I'm coming here today with some very concrete uh, recommendations of things that I think we can do to try to uh, make things a little bit better. Uh, I, I understand that we are never going to really be able to prevent all outages um, or ensure that all outages are resolved quickly. Um, from a fiscal standpoint, it's just not feasible to underground all of our wires. Uh, or hire enough workers to do that. But we do have to do better. There's just no question about it. And we've been talking about this for a very long time. And, and I do uh, share the view of the elected officials that have spoken already today that um, it doesn't seem to be getting better, even though we are absolutely getting more reliant on electricity and we are, we are going to be facing more storms. There's just no question that uh, with climate change, we are going to be facing this issue over and over again, and we are getting more reliant on electricity. Look at the look at the form that we're in today. Um, you know, we're just now getting used to the fact that uh, when electricity goes out, our phones go out. Um, but but imagine what it's going to be like when um, once electricity goes out, we don't own. Not only are are we going to lose our phones and our TV, but we're also not going to be able to charge our cars, and we're not going to be able to to use public transportation or turn on the heat. So we really do have to, to find a way to address these issues. And so I'm coming here uh, today with, to try to offer some concrete suggestions that I, that I think might, might help. Um, and I think it, it begins um, with some, some basic ideas about accountability and transparency and a focus um, on reliability that, um, that I think we need to, to increase. And I'll, I'll start with accountability because I'm, I'm sure, as I know the, the commissioners know, um, these are not, uh, the, the customers of these utilities are captive. They cannot simply leave when, when they don't like the service that they're getting from their utility. They are stuck with them. And the consequences for providing bad service are really hearings like this, or maybe in the legislature or some bad press, but, but it's not like the customers have the ability to say, I don't like the service you're giving me, so I'm gonna to go to somebody else. Um, after Hurricane Irene and Superstorm Sandy, uh, the board did issue a series of orders that were designed to kind of replace that ability and, and make the utilities do some things that were supposed to improve their performance. Um, and the board in also invited the utilities to, to propose some programs, some infrastructure programs that were supposed to help our resilience. And um, they did that. And, but as far as I'm, I can understand, there has not really been a systematic review of whether or not the things that were done after Sandy and Irene, whether or not they were in fact what we needed to do and whether or not um, those were the, the measures that we needed to do in order to improve our resilience. Um, we know, what we do know is that uh, altogether ratepayers have spent over $6 billion since Irene and Sandy to try to improve our resilience. It's 1.7 billion on the electric side and 4.5 billion on the gas side. And um, you know, we check very carefully, uh, both board staff and rate council to make sure that the utilities are in fact spending the money on what they said they were gonna spend the money. And most of that has been to raise substations and um, 
replace gas mains. And they have spent it and they have spent it on what they said they were gonna spend it. But what we haven't seen is that review to say, is that what we should have been doing to bring about better results when the storm comes? In the staff report, um, the staff noted that it's difficult to measure the, the, whether or not these, these programs have brought uh, benefits without sufficient evaluation time. And, but that it appears the post Sandy completed projects experienced less damage than the older, more vulnerable overhead infrastructure. And that may be true, but I, I submit that we need a better analysis. We urge the board to undertake an independent, don't just ask the utilities to do the analysis, but undertake an independent and comprehensive and systematic analysis of the storm resilience programs that have been undertaken to date and determine whether we are implementing the right approach or whether or not we need to do some other things or um, do something different in order to achieve better results. Uh, we also believe that the board should look at some accountability issues that are inherent in the board's regulations, the board's reliability regulations, that's NJAC 14 5-8.10. Those regulations basically rely on two metrics to measure reliability. Um, it's the customer average inter interruption duration index known as Katie and then SAFE, System Average Interruption Frequency Index. One's duration, one's frequency. And so under those, the board looks at a five-year period and um, compares the utility's performance to its performance during that five-year period. It was recently updated to 2010 to 2014. And if the um, performance compared to that five-year period is at least as good with a very a standard deviation of uh, 1.5, then they're deemed to be in compliance. Um, now, but this is actually a really easy standard to meet for a few reasons. First of all, major storms are excluded from that data. And, and that actually does make sense on a certain level because if you include major storms, it's gonna skew the data and you're not really gonna be able to tell whether their normal reliability is, is good or not. And I understand that that makes some sense, but then we need to have another standard to look at for actual storm performance. And we don't have that. And I think that um, it would be great if the board would either would establish a, just a storm reliability metric that we look at. Um, also, the, um, the way the regulation is set up, if you, were, if you were not good between 2010 and 2014, you kind of get a pass, right? Um, the, the, the companies that had good reliability in 2010 to 2014 are held to a higher standard than the ones that weren't good. So it, it, in some ways, it, it rewards mediocrity, and, and that's something that, that I think we should deal with. Um, and then finally, the consequences, if you don't meet the, the, the standards of the regulation are pretty weak. Uh, there's no penalties in the, in the reg, there's no time deadlines to achieve compliance, and there are no specific corrective actions met, mentioned. Um, I think the regs would allow the board to uh, set a higher standard or, or bring an enforcement action, but to my knowledge that, that hasn't been done. So, so we would also urge the board to look at that regulation and see whether or not it can be strengthened. And we would most certainly urge the board to establish within that regulation, a specific storm metric that these utilities would be held to and actually have a, 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 you know, an enforcement mechanism that you could hold them to. Um, and another area where we think the board could take action is on transparency. Uh, the board has really um, required a significant number of measures for, that the utilities have been required to take, as, as the president mentioned, since Sandy and Irene. And a lot of those have required a variety of record keeping and reporting requirements uh, that provide very valuable information. All of those records are, are reported to the board. We get some of them, but not all of them. And um, it's filed with the board. Some of it could be confidential, but most of it is not. Um, but most of it is never posted. And the board has done tremendous work in the last few years to increase the amount of information that's posted on its website. We would urge the board to include this information uh, among that and uh, include that information. I, I personally believe that when regulated entities know that the information they are reporting will be made public, 
that they strive to make it look as, as good as possible. And it's a motivator for compliance and improvement. And so I, we would also urge the board to post that information on their website. I think that would, that would be very helpful. Um, another area that I think the board could, could look at, uh, the president mentioned this in his opening remarks, is AMI. Um, the staff report noted that AMI should assist with storm response, but then also noted that uh, Rockland Electric, which was the one utility that had AMI at the time of a um, tropical storm Isaias came through, was slow to respond. And now we have other utilities who will be installing AMI over the next several years. And um, they have uh, cited storm response as one of the benefits of AMI. But what I have heard from um, many of my counterparts and consultants who work in other states that have AMI is that um, even though AMI has many useful functionalities, if you don't use them for those purposes, then those benefits don't accrue. So we urge the board to be very diligent and steadfast in making sure that these use cases that the utilities are touting um, in promoting the benefits of AMI do actually come to pass. Because we've heard in other states that they were told that these benefits would come to pass and then they don't. So um, this should be a benefit of AMI. Let's make sure that it actually is. Um, and that, that the utilities do take advantage of these use cases and that if there are storm benefits that we can get from AMI, that we do in fact get them. And then finally, I think that, you know, the most important issue is focus. Um, we are in a tremendous period of, of transformation in the energy sector. And it's not surprising that the utilities and their investors want to be part of it. But we can't forget that the most important thing that the utilities do is keep the lights on. And um, every time we look at this issue, every single time, including the staff report, um, it's clear that falling trees are the biggest source of outages in storms. Trees account for one quarter to one third of outages in a storm and equipment failure is accounting for about another 20%. So why is it, why isn't enhanced tree trimming or equipment maintenance the first order of post-storm business? Well, because for the most part, those costs are considered operations and maintenance expenses rather than capital costs. And that means that while the utilities get paid for tree trimming, they do not earn the same level of profit that they do as for a capital expense. So the focus is on Wall Street and for maximizing their profits rather than on Main Street um, and, and reducing the outages. Now to the board's credit, you did very much enhance the tree trimming requirements after Superstorm Sandy, and I have no reason to believe that the utilities aren't complying with those requirements, but they do complain about various obstacles to, to doing better, like um, off, off right of way trees and things like that. But what we have found is that once you start proposing ways to get around those obstacles, such as knocking on the door of a, of a, of a house and saying, hey, would you mind if we trim that tree that's on your property because it could knock down this power line, they're getting tremendous cooperation from the homeowners. And so a lot of these common sense fixes are things that will bring uh, substantial improvement. Um, working with the board's energy division, we have begun to ask in the context of rate cases and mergers for what we call in, uh, either reliability or tree trimming improvement plans. Um, in the last, uh, you'll be happy to hear, uh, mayors, that in the last JCPNL uh, rate case, we asked for a tree trimming improvement plan from JCPNL, and it is now in place and hopefully will bring about some, some benefits. We did this a while back with Atlantic City Electric. We did a reliability improvement plan. And what we found is that when the utilities embrace these plans, we actually do see improvement. Um, they have been very successful. And um, we just believe that once the utilities focus on the, on the bread and butter, um, that, that there is improvement and it can be done. And we understand that, that tree trimming is not exotic or, or cutting edge, um, but it is central and it needs to be central. And, and we hope that the board will send that message to the utilities that yes, we want you to be part of the, of the transformation of this industry, but we also want you to do the job that we really need you to do, which is to keep the lights on. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Director. And uh, there, there are just a couple of things that you mentioned that I feel obligated mm -hmm. to um, mention. Number one, that message has been sent many times. And uh, the, the utilities know well that one of the things that we do monitor closely is tree trimming. And one of the things that raises the most um, problem among many residents, and I'd like to see your report regarding that, is trying to cut trees on private property off the right of way. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, one, one of the basic things that government has as a tool to help keep, and I hate to use this term, uh, folks in line is to find them, you know, hit them in the pocketbook. And we have been working with the state legislature for years to try to increase the fine levels. Yeah. And it has gone nowhere. And I think you are aware of the maximum amount that we can find multi-million dollar corporations. And it is a fine ladies and gentlemen, that everyone on this call would probably be able to pay with very little effort. That's how inexpensive it is. And we continue to work with the um, legislature to try to increase those fines, to make it a little bit more um, apparent that we desire certain types of behavior and, uh, and, and so on. So, if we can work together on that, as we always do, Stephanie, I think that would be great. Yes, and that's why it was so effective when we did it in the context of a merger case or a rate case where they're coming in and they want something from the board to say, okay, but we wanna see your liability improve. And that is one of the criteria, certainly. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Ada, go on. I would like to call upon Andrew Sykes. Please state your full name for the record. Mr. Sykes, are you on mute, sir? Go to the next one, please. I would like to call upon Klaus Brinkrode. Please state your full name for the record. Yeah, good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Klaus Brinkrode, K-L-A-U-S, last name Brinkrode, B-R-I-N-K-R-O-D-E. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the time and the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a resident in Bergen County. I live in Washington Township, and I just want to share some of the experiences uh, me and my family have uh, went through after Isaiah and the aftermath. So my opening statement, or I think we can all agree is um, that no response necessary to the storm would have been probably the best case. Yeah, but as many other speakers have said before, uh, this is an ongoing pro uh, problem and we're doing the same thing over and over again. So uh, this meeting sounds like to me that like we're evaluating surgery on a desk patient here. So uh, from my personal experience here, we lost power for about four days, uh, was on and off and was increasing uh, anxiety at this point yeah, until the power was fully uh, restored. Uh, loud noisy generators from the neighborhoods were running well into the early morning hours and uh, the extra, they're extra loud when they're not yours. So uh, spoiled food was mentioned, uh, which we experience here. So my estimated cost of loss was about $500 just in the storm. So economic impact, we're not able to work from home. Uh, my business in, or the business I work for in Ellendale, New Jersey was actually heavier affected than I was and uh, brought all the service down. We had no access to any kind of information we needed to work from. So we were out of work for about five days. Uh, was limited access to email and internet so we could uh, communicate with our customers. Uh, the cellular uh, networks now are being powered by standby generators, but while the main infrastructure is down, also the cable, uh, you can see that the cell phone networks are totally overloaded 
and cannot provide reliable services for the demand there is during the power outages. So Isaiah for us and my family was really the last straw which triggered the purchase of a portable generator and the upgrade of our electrical box, which is about summed up to about $2,000. I would have happily given the $2,000 to PSENG or any other service provider if they can provide me with reliable service. Yeah. Uh, the utilities in general in our area is PSENG. They seem to be overwhelmed with uh, communication and restoration efforts due to the extensive and widespread damage the storm left behind. But we also wanted to say that in my area, I have seen work crews uh, out of state which were truly working 24 hours in a very uh, hard environment. So kudos to the hardline workers who actually were on the street and did the hard work uh, bringing us the power back. So um, the, the PSNG website and Twitter accounts went down as this is not the first time this actually happened during a major storm event. So I, I personally do not understand how this website goes down actually during the worst time. It seems to be an ongoing problem PSENG has. Also the uh, information provided, uh, what they mentioned with uh, JC Power, uh, we had a very similar experience that the maps are not appropriately updated, but uh, we have limited access to it anyway. Customer service representatives, we reached over the phone and only limited information for us and always stated that the restoration times are worst case scenarios. So in my personal opinion, uh, what I've seen here uh, over the years, I personally believe utility companies are not the only one to blame here. Yeah. In today's world, utilities are forced to spend more and more time into crisis management instead of focusing on, the fo focusing on giving us reliable power. The unreliable and old infrastructure, which crumbles and fails after every small weather event. Yeah, I've seen after many times, a storm shows up on the weather radar, utilities crisis manager run to Twitter and announce their customers that service might be disrupted and that we should charge all our portable devices. Yeah, it sounds like bracing for impact, yeah, but we don't know how hard we're gonna get hit. So. I don't know if this is still an adequate response in the 21st century. Yeah. I do not expect my roofer to call me when it starts raining to tell me that I need to have a bucket and a mop ready. So this is a very similar experience here. So, and also considering the financial destruction on the government, our businesses and us as private citizens. As I had mentioned, I was four days out of work. So this is a major economic impact. The, the Biden administration actually just this week announced that climate emergencies are predict, predicting an increasing number of storms, increasing number of growing intensity of weather systems seem in, in, inevitable. And I wanted to see what the BPU actually is planning to do for this. As uh, uh, Mrs. Brent had mentioned, uh, we're going into the next century here with electrification of our automobiles. So our our electrical lines become the gas stations in the, of the 21st century. So we need to have a reliable service and infrastructure available to feed all these uh, communication devices in our automobiles. So the BPU or our government has promised infrastructure improvements after Sandy, but I personally believe it's more frail than ever. I've seen some small infrastructure improvements. As was mentioned, 1.8 billion was invested into uh, electrical improvement infrastructure, but the majority went into the gas lines, which I personally experienced in the neighboring town where basically every street was dug up and new gas lines were put in. And what Mr. Farrow said, why isn't there a coordinated response? Yeah. We, we have high technology, we have trenchless technology available to put utilities underground and we can do it together. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't not, is it's not necessary that the gas company is digging up the street, closing it up and two months later, the water company comes after it and we're doing the same thing again. So I think there's a lot of taxpayers money wasted 
by having not a unified approach here. So the only feasible way to increase reliability in my personal opinion is to bring the electric uh, grid underground. And I've seen it in many cities here in the United States. I think San Diego started around 20 years ago. So it is a huge task and probably cannot be done within the next five to 10 years, but we have to start in one point. This cannot go on. Also, I want to bring to the attention to the board, if we're talking about infrastructure improvement programs, how many lives are being lost due to electrocution, uh, electrical fires, accidents involving utility poles, not to mention the victims who get killed from carbon monoxide poisoning while being forced to operate portable generators due to power outages. Yeah. These are important facts in my opinion, which must be considered for improvement programs. Yeah. It is no longer a co cosmetic fix to bring power underground. I think it's a necessity. So, so these are basically my statements and my experience, uh, what I had from the aftermath of uh, Isaia. And I wanted to uh, reiterate here, the $2,000 I had to spend for a portable generator, which I also need to maintain now, I would have happily given to PSENG if they could provide me with reliable service. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thank you for uh, participating, sir. We appreciate it very much. Ada? I would like to call upon Jim Bacolt. Please state your full name for the record. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Jim Fakelt, and I am president of Jersey Central Power and Light. Uh, it's F-A-K-U-L-T. So let me start out by uh, saying uh, good morning to uh, President Fertiliso, as well as all of the commissioners and all of the elected officials and customers that are on today. Like you, we are here to listen. And my company stands ready to follow up on any and all issues or questions raised today. And I've already heard a few that I've taken notes that we'll be following up on. So first of all, regarding Tropical Storm ECES, you know, we do appreciate the board's report uh, in that they did find the restoration to be reasonable and compliance with the previous or existing uh, storm orders to be, um, you know, fulfilled. But having said that, we do know that we need to continue to make enhancements to our system, particularly in the areas of communications and providing accurate ETRs. And I heard that today. So on behalf of our customers, we look forward to continuing to work with all of you. Uh, we continue to look forward to working with the board and with the staff to, con you know, to find ways to make these enhancements in the areas of restoration, communications, and all of that because as President Fertiliso said, we will have additional severe weather events. So we are in the process of uh, responding to all of the board orders that came out of this event. And uh, we'll be of course submitting those as we I think already have submitted one or two of the responses, but over the next couple of months. And you know, just a couple other quick things. Um, the uh, questions that came up from the uh, mayor of East Amwell, I think there was a couple of uh, you know, items that he had asked and uh, you know, President Fertile. So what I would say is that, you know, even literally days after the storm in August, my team pulled together and we started to do a self-assessment. And the areas that we, uh, we started to work on is our uh, focus on improving the accuracy and the timeliness of getting ETRs or those estimated time of restorations out into uh, the system and into the field. And that's a process that uh, we, uh, we are working to refine. And I believe we're making good progress there. You know, the second thing is how we communicate with our local officials. We're, we're changing uh, some processes there to provide, um, you know, better, more accurate and timely information as well, because we heard that loud and clear. And then the third thing is just in general, improving communications through multiple channels, whether it's through our website or text messaging or, or other medium that we use. So I think to the question of the mayor, those are just a couple of the things and they do dovetail in my mind well with what the board's, um, you know, orders that came out as we work through those. So, um, you know, again, that's an ongoing uh, piece of work there. Uh, you know, uh, the um, committeeman, uh, Mill Millstone Township, two things. I, I like the idea of a group, um, my team, my leadership team, we're absolutely uh, willing right now at any time to sit down with you or to sit down with any and all of the communities uh, to talk about the response and what maybe, you know, went well and what, you know, didn't, what can, you know, what we can do to get better. And we have met with, with many, many, many towns uh, already 
And, you know, if we haven't yet with uh, you and your town, we absolutely uh, stand ready to meet with you and, and quite frankly, look forward to it. So I think that's a good idea. You know, I also in these meetings would like to get that, some of that specific information about customers that were out nine, 10, 11 days, because that, that's just, you know, not uh, consistent with what I had heard and what we believe happened. So if there's an anomaly or if there's a customer that somehow fell through the cracks, I want to know specifically about, you know, the, the address and who it was. We can go back, look at our records, and we could uh, certainly, you know, um, understand what happened there. So more than anything, I do appreciate the opportunity to talk. You know, one last comment I would, you know, just like to make, you know, we just completed uh, on December 31st of last year, uh, a, a reliability improvement plan. It's the IIP, we called it Reliability Plus. It was an investment of a, just a little bit under $100 million that we spent over the last 18 months to improve the reliability and the resiliency of our electric distribution system here. And this topic came up quite a bit, but about 42 or 43 million of those dollars were spent directly in vegetation management. And we agree that that's an area that needs to continue to get focus and continue to um, you know, work on to improve reliability. So as always, we appreciate the opportunity to participate in a conversation like this and to you know, just continue to have dialogue. Again, uh, you know, President Fierliso with, uh, with you, the other commissioners, your staff, and all of our community stakeholders. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you uh, for your input. Certainly appreciate it. Ada? I would like to call upon Jeff Tittle. Please state your full name for the record. Sure. Jeff Tittle, Director, uh, New Jersey Sierra Club. And uh, I want to thank you for reopening the dialogue uh, between those that are involved, whether they're rate payers or interested parties and the board. I think it's something that you know, it was long overdue, and I want to thank you, uh, President Federico, and the board for doing that. I think it's important that you get feedback from different uh, stakeholders um, on important issues. So I'm glad this is happening, and hopefully there'll be more. I just wanted to start off and, and say that, um, you know, we've been, and I've been going to these types of meetings for a very long time. And, you know, as we're moving into the 21st century, we still have a 19th century grid and it's still a problem. And there are so many different pieces of it that we really need to look at. But I, I want to really at first at least concentrate on what I think is the opportunity uh, moving forward. Um, you know, I, I think the report had many good things in there about smart metering. But what we really need to do is you know, develop an, a, a more smart grid technology like they have in Europe. And we need to also not only have AMI as part of it, but tie it to DAR and distributive generation and demand side, developing more microgrids, increasing efficiency to our grid and, um, you know, and then connecting our grid with battery storage and other storage facilities, you know, ways of storing, as well as, you know, renewable energy that's, as I said, you know, um, like, you know, solar farms and other things to connect in. And I think that would help with the overall reliability and resilience to the grid. And as we, you know, people have said, you know, things are going to get worse or potentially because of storms. The other thing I wanted to mention is we should be putting lines underground. I was literally at a meeting 35 years ago where they said it would take too long to put these um, wires underground. Well, 35 years later, maybe we could have made some progress. And, you know, New Jersey actually has a law in the books on new developments requiring underground utilities, but we've waived it every time. Uh, we really need to take a better look at that and also looking at, you know, change, even changing our grid um, to an extent for moving things for over distances to bury DC cables versus the large overhead cables. We need to really reinvent our grid moving forward. I would also say that now there are certain areas that we do know where we have the problem that happens all the times with trees or, you know, when the storm damage, maybe that we should do is target certain areas where we, you know, um, see things happen on a pretty regular basis. I mean, I'm in Lambertville and, you know, we've got problems with Route 29 and trees along it, but maybe that's an area to bury the cables where it comes up. Uh, I also think that we need to sort of change the system that we have, that we have a perverse incentive and in program where 
you can make, you know, utilities can make a lot of money off of the rate payers by putting the same line back up six, seven times in a 10 year period. Uh, you know, we had an incident in, in here in Lamerville years ago where the substation, which was built next to a creek, you know, flooded three times in three years before they finally raised it. But each time they're making a very good rate of return for fixing that um, substation that was put in the wrong place. And so maybe we need to change how we, um, you know, pay for storms because basically you know, they can bring in crews from out of the state, they can charge double, you know, overtime. And the more it costs, the more money they get in a rate of return. Uh, maybe we should think of not allowing them to have such a high rate of return. In fact, they make more money re putting the same line up over and over again than they get for burying a line or making the grid more resilient. And so, you know, I think we really need to change um, what we do. And as someone who has JCPNL in two places, I can tell you that up in Ringwood, we had we were out of power up there. I mean, I'm not there all the time. It's a summer place, but 17 days without power during one of the storms. And I do know people in East Amwell who were out with eight or nine days um, during Isaiah. Um, you know, my line is that JCPNL stands for Jesus Christ, pray for light, because every time it's, the wind blows, you get nervous. And I think we need to, you know, change the dynamic. But more importantly, I think this gives us an opportunity to um, upgrade uh, our grids and to move our grids into the 21st century. And I think that's a critical next step that we need to be taking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And uh, I agree with you on the grid uh, aspect here. And I think it's um, obviously an important factor. We're, we're putting more strain on the grid and that grid has to be uh, suitable for a variety of different interconnections that are coming its way. And, uh, and it, 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 a lot of it boils down to a regional and national approach. And uh, as you know, New Jersey is part of uh, the PJM uh, states where uh, they are our, our regional uh, transmission organization. And uh, there has to be a regional approach and we've been working with PJM and I'm hoping now with also uh, the new FERC the composition of the new firm in order to promote upgrade in our grid uh, uh, process, because this is this is vital as we move forward. I want to thank you for your input. Uh, go on, Ada. I would like to call upon Leon Patel. Please state your full name for the record. Leon Patel. Um I'm an older person, so I don't know how to do these things very well. First of all, um, I'm representing the Village Grand at Bear Creek. We are a retirement uh, community located um, in Mercer County. We have 540 homes uh, and about a thousand residents. At the head of this, I don't have a prepared presentation, but at the head of this, I would like to say that I am very impressed by the elected officials that I've heard and the members of the board and particularly the division of rate council. Um, recently, uh, we went through ESAIS and we had a great deal of problems. I'm newly elected to the board. So it fell to the newly elected board members to deal with this. We are an over 55 community and many of our residents are more elderly and uh, somewhat infirm. And it was a great difficulty to us to deal with the outfall of that event. We have recently put in place plans to deal and help our more infirm residents deal with future, <clears throat> excuse me, deal with future events such as this. But that is not something that we um, can do without some adequate communication. So first of all, uh, we had problems. We apparently, and I'm not an electrical engineer, so I don't know about this, but our community was designed and built in three electrical phases. We had problems with communication between those phases. We finally found an engineer in the engineering department of JCPNL who would talk to us. Uh, and he came out and we finally were able to solve some of those issues. So thank you to JCPNL for that. 
More importantly though, and I'm going to give kudos to um, Ms. Brand, um, I think that we have focused more on the issues to do with the organization of JCPNL itself as member of a group called uh, First Energy, a energy holding company in Ohio. Now we responded in the matter of JCPNL BGS creditworthiness. Uh, and we wrote a three page letter detailing the issues that we felt that they had. So I'm just gonna briefly hit some top points. First of all, uh, in looking at their organization, uh, it's apparent that they have not spent much money on some of the needed efforts over the last many years. Um, apologies to, um, to Mr. Fakult, but it is difficult to know when we throw around numbers like $100 million of spending exactly what is spent it on and exactly what effect it may have had. As I recall correct, if I recall correctly, the, uh, that was that rate case, the $100 million uh, was in response to Hurricane Sandy uh, and probably included a great deal of what I'll call a remedial effort. So, I think some of the things that we would focus on would be to speak to uh, matters of communication. Certainly, I think the elected members of our panel today have done a very good job of highlighting those. I don't need to. But I think one of the things that struck me about communication was looking at the record between BPU and the Division of Rate Council. And I was very surprised to learn that BPU keeps certain matters from DRC. So I don't wanna start a political war between the two organizations, but what I would say is that in my limited experience with rate regulated utilities, it would be very useful if both parties communicated completely and fully and that BPU staff not keep matters that may be important from DRC. DRC represents the rate payers, if I understand New Jersey law correctly. I am more familiar with a uh, state that has BPU and DRC in the same organization, and therefore there is no uh, communication issues. I think the second thing is that to uh, Ms. Brand's testimony this morning, there are a couple of things that jumped out to me. One is accountability. Um, I have heard a couple of the local um, politicians and leaders indicate that they would like to get together and have a joint working group, which I think is laudable. But I also think that you have to have fully empowered members of that working group that can actually get something done. Again, with apologies to Mr. Fakult, I don't know that he is fully in control of his own fisc. In other words, he needs cash money to do things. So there are two focuses that I would put there. Number one, and we responded to the BGS creditworthiness statement. He is at the mercy of his holding company. Uh, First Energy has a very sorry record of managing their own internal fisc. Um, and we made note of it um, in our letter to the board, which was uh, received and Ida or Ms. Camacho were, responded to it. The one thing that we have to be very careful about is that he has adequate funds. So, and I'm all over the map here, so I apologize for that. But one of the things that uh, Ms. Brand mentioned uh, had to do with the return on um, equity and I would suggest in this rate regulated model that we have here, that in addition to the equity that is formally shown on their private financial statements, that added to the rate base might also be the cost of repair or vegetation maintenance. So that their return funds those areas and remediation takes place as part of the rate-based consideration. I think that would be useful. The second thing is, is that JCPNL is a member of a cash pooling system within 
the uh, First Energy Group. One of the things that I'd like to point out, even though um, I think one of the members of Division of Rate Council, um, one of the staff lawyers there, did a very good job of indicating the ring fencing measures, that there are still avenues open to First Energy or another member of that company structure to take money from JCPNL. We recommend that their funds be kept to themselves as all other members, and that certain remedial financial measures take place to assure that monies are not moved between the companies. This will permit cash required to be maintained within JCPNL and used for the upgrades and the maintenance and things that it has to be. So with accountability and the ability and the responsibility of making decisions also has to come the material or the cash used to make those and enforce those decisions. The next thing that we found in a review of what was going on in this company structure was that it does not appear that financial audits are conducted of um, the constituent companies. There is an audit, but that appears to be more focused on the administrative structure for uh, looking at uh, the rate base and things like that, or the auction system. So we were, I was very surprised at that because I'm more used to a, a structure in which there occurs a financial audit and an operational audit. We've talked about two simple measures or maybe additional simple measures of rate reliability, of service reliability and things like that. It seems to me that when we consider the rate structures, and the rate base, all elements have to go into the consideration of the rate base so that adequate funds are provided to these electric companies to maintain the distribution structure. Um, I think JCPNL has divested itself of any ownership positions it used to have in generation. So they're solely in the game of distribution. Um, and we have to take this 19th century, as one of the speakers pointed out, uh, rate regulated utility structure, rethink it and put it together. Now, it seems to me that New Jersey, and you know, I'm not native to New Jersey, we moved here many years ago, but I'm, I'm still not familiar with the way the state government works. It would be useful to rethink how we do things to strengthen communication between BPU and DRC, to look at the audit structure and make sure we understand exactly what these companies are doing and how they're using their money, rebuild the rate base, uh, rate regulated utility structure, refocus because uh, wind power and things like that are very sexy and wonderful and we all love to talk about them but the basic stuff that actually needs to happen is very mundane. Um, and it involves things like trees and rights of way and things like that. So um, I'm gonna get off the, uh, I, I also would like to support the smart grid approach because I think a smart grid approach would allow much better communication between the actual location of the outage the management of JCPNL, and I'm sorry to be on JCPNL, I'm sure the other electric utilities have problems too, but you know, we need something that gives information instantly to the management. They can dispatch the work crews. Um, I have only in my life seen, and I've lived here 12 years in a JCPNL service ter territory, I've seen JCPNL trucks twice. It may be the same truck and I just saw it twice, I'm not sure. But um, they use, they have to use uh, contractors. And to me, that seems very strange. I can see contractor use for surge capacity, but not for base capacity. So when I look at this, I think that it needs a top-down holistic review of what we do and how we do it. Uh, there are practical things that can be done to assure that the accountability so that when the elected members of this board um, 
meet with uh, JCPNL and stuff, they actually have a way of accomplishing things that they agree to. The money is present to do it. They communicate. Um, and I'm just going to leave it there because I've spoken long enough. Uh, but I think uh, we sent the letter that we sent has some practical um, suggestions as to how the board may begin a financial review, uh, how DRC may participate in that, how they may also keep control of the cash, which is vitally important. Uh, and I won't bother anybody with the details, but it's quite clear that uh, First Energy is not at all near where its peers are in managing its systems and managing its constituent uh, um, company. So I'll stop at that, say thank you very much for this opportunity. I can report back to the, our board and community that uh, you were kind enough to let me speak um, and hopefully uh, we'll make progress in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your input and uh, I uh, assure you we, we will make progress in the future. And number two, to my knowledge, and if Director Brand has a different opinion, I'd be happy to hear it. Um, we don't necessarily operate in cement silos. Uh, there is communication between uh, the Board of Public Utilities and the Division of Ray Council. Okay. Staffs are constantly talking to one another and, uh, and so on. And uh, Ms. Brand and I uh, actually like one another. So I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure where you're getting that information from, but I just want to I, set I, the record straight. Actually, uh, President Pierre Deliso, I got it right from the record from BPU. So what I looked at, uh, because when you communicate back and forth, you communicate to DRC, and it's not you necessarily personally to um, direct a brand, but rather your staffs communicate with one another. There are certain things that DRC asks for that BPU staff does not communicate on the grounds that it is sensitive and um, it is not something that their elect uh, utility would like to be communicated. Now, I would just say that there's nothing that I know of that is so sensitive in any electrical generation system that is that sensitive that cannot be communicated to the divisional rate council. Okay. Well, uh, Commissioner uh, or uh, Director uh, Brennan and I will talk about that uh, offline. Thank you, sir. Ada? I would like to call upon Stanislav Jaraz. Please state your full name for the record. Do we have Stanislav? Please go to the next person, Ada. I would like to call upon Jessica Johnson. Please state your full name for the record. Ms. Johnson? No, Ms. Johnson. Go to the next person, please. I would like to call upon Rosella Clyde. Please state your full name for the record. Hello, my name is Rosella Clyde, R-O-Z-E-L-L-A-C-L-Y-D-E. -E. Um, and I live in Chatham Borough, which is located in the southeastern uh, corner of Morris County. Um, I want to echo everything that Mayor Wolf said. Um, I, uh, it is uh, so, you know, just in a matter of saving time. Um, the Chatham experience was very similar to uh, to everything that uh, Mayor Wolf said, and I also. Um, uh, so I've lived in Chatham Borough for nine years and I serve on a number of local municipal and state committees and I have a keen interest in sustainability and environmental issues. Um, I have a PhD in instructional design for online learning so I have some experience in pro project design and development and I have a and I am a JCPNL customer. I have to say that smart meters might make a, a, are a step in the right direction. It, it was totally amazing to me that JCPNL de depended upon 
individual people with power out, customers with, with power out to telephone them and let them know their power was out in, in this in this day and age. That is really um, uh, incredible to me. Uh, there were there were sections of Chatham Borough that were out of power for 11 days with um, uh, with hurricane with this, the storm Isaiah's and um, and and I could just go down through some several of the things that that Mayor Wolf has already said and that um, Committee Man Farrow has said. Um, also, I'm um, interested in the uh, in in all the aspects of undergrounding that have already been mentioned. Uh, I I we've tried uh, in Chattanooga. We have tried to make communications with uh, JCPNL about what the actual cost would be, and all we get is it's too expensive. It's too expensive. We've asked for uh, for specific information on how much it would cost, and they said, "Well, we've done studies on it, but we haven't found any of those studies. They do not appear um, on on the JCPNL website." And so I I know I saw uh, President uh, Fair Delis. So at the uh, wind turbine conference on Wednesday and Thursday, um, and he spoke to us. Uh, I look at the, at the at the nice little wind turbine pin that, that he's wearing on his on his um, lapel, and we're investing a tremendous amount of money in developing uh, um, energy from from wind power, and all of that power is going to be brought on shore through cables that are underground. So don't tell me that we don't have the capacity to put wiring underground. I agree with everything that uh, Committee Man Farrell has said about about um, municipalities coming together and working for this. Uh, I'm uh, Chatham is part of a group of, of 17 other municipalities in the Morris County, Union County, and Essex County area. And I am certain that we would find the same kind of cooperation there. But I wanna talk from the perspective of the trees. And um, I belong to Sierra Club, so I, uh, so I appreciate everything that Mr. Tuttle said, but let me talk about trees in Chatham, uh, because our tree canopy streets are part of what makes Chatham a desirable place to live and work. The quality of our tree canopy has an impact on property values and indirectly on our tax revenues. Chatham has been designated tree city by many local real estate groups. It's not just the aesthetic value. A healthy tree canopy cleanses the air by producing oxygen and storing carbon reserves in the very tree trunks that rise to support that foliage. The intricate root systems developed by healthy trees assist in soil preservation, provide a catch basin for stormwater runoff, and protect the riverbanks along the Passaic River, as well as the ponds and streams that are part of the Passaic Riparian Re Network. Our stable and secure tree cover, cover is literally being undermined by the way JCPNL has been allowed to butcher the trees along their right of ways to protect the overhead wiring. In most cases, it is those unstable trees that break, pulling down overhead wires as they fall. It is through the carving out of large central source of the tree canopy, this type of extreme pruning or total removal of tree stock along their overhead wires that the stability of this foliage is threatened. And these are the trees that break and become totally uprooted. In addition to that, the line poles utilized in the borough were also extremely old. Many are listing and have been temporarily reinforced. Eight years ago during Hurricane Sandy, JCPNL actually ran out of replacement poles and residents were forced to wait longer until new poles could be trucked in from out of state. New Jersey must find more sustainable ways to address the power needs of our residents. We must require companies that are involved in this process to find more creative ways to protect against the storm damage. One given is that the storms will continue to increase in frequency and intensity. All stakeholders must must respond to that challenge, and JCPNL has not demonstrated a commitment to play a major role in the in, in that area of the resiliency battle. Too many people are saying that it's too expensive. We would really like to know how expensive it is to do the undergrounding. And I agree completely with Mr. What, what Mr. Tuttle said that 35 years ago, he was talking to people about this. And if we had started the process 35 years ago, it uh, you know, we would be a long ways down the, down the road right now. So trees are not just aesthetic. 
They're not just something that gets in the way. When we're talking about climate change, we're going to have to find ways to cleanse our environment. And if we just get rid of our trees and the vegetation, we're hurting ourselves in other ways. So I'm really, really interested in the specifics about what it would cost to start putting some of our wiring underground and actually address a resiliency uh, problem and create a more resiliency in this entire network um, for the entire state of New Jersey. But right now I'm interested in Chatham Borough. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I have learned a lot from all of the speakers who have already spoken. Uh, I appreciate the extreme amount of technical knowledge that people are sharing. I don't have all that technical knowledge, but I do realize that there are major places uh, in uh, across this country that have already done their undergrowing. We actually had a, um, uh, a, uh, a speaker come in from uh, from a community in Colorado that's been underground for 30 years, and they have not had a single electric outage, outage in that entire 30-year time. So I encourage the, um, the commission to really look at the specifics, get us the numbers, find us so we can really find out what kind of costs we're talking about uh, and, and, and how we could start doing it. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Thank you for your input, uh, Ms. Clyde. Um, Ada? I would like to call upon Ed Minal. Please state your full name for the record. Hi, uh, Ed Minal. That's E-D-M-I-N-A-L-L. -L. And I live in uh, Scotch Plains. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the the opportunity to talk here and everybody who's spoken already. Um, you know, I just kind of want to focus on when we talk about uh, vegetation management, I honestly think we're looking at tree removal versus pruning or line clearing. Uh, the utility companies do a very aggressive pruning and line clearing practices, which are very detrimental to the trees. When you re remove more than 30% of a tree canopy, that makes the tree asymmetrical and susceptible to diseases. So healthy symmetrical trees are able to counterbalance themselves during high winds. Asymmetrical trees don't have the ability to counterbalance themselves during high winds. Therefore, the trees fall during storm events and high winds taking the wires down with them. Shade tree, shade tree planting practices in the past located tall trees directly behind a curb, which is within the overhead wires alignment. Smarter planting of trees could be done where an understory type tree could be planted and the tree could be placed at the edge of the right-of-way, not within the right-of-way. And the understory type tree would grow no higher than the lowest wire. Linemen from other states, when they're called in to emergencies here in New Jersey, uh, they think we're insane due to the amount of vegetation that we have within our overhead wires, our, our electrical grid system. They can't believe that uh, trees are intertwined with the, with the overhead electrical grid. Uh, and, and with that being said, you know, if you can take into consideration the costs of property damage, uh, reactively performing line repair in the tree removal, and the public health safety aspect and alignment safety aspect. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but we talked about the safety pyramid in the construction industry, where a number of smaller air misses and minor incidences will, will lead up to a fatality. So you kind of have the same situation with the over electrical grid, where uh, you have trees and, and lines and uh, even utility poles falling. And eventually, and unfortunately, there's going to be a fatality if uh, you know if if it continues. It's it's just the uh, the law of probability. Sooner or later, unfortunately, someone's going to perish due to uh, you know a down line or a down tree. And uh, you know, and I hear people talk about going underground uh, versus the overhead electrical grid. Uh, you know, we know there's a huge cost with that. Not only that, you have to get uh, easement 
access to people's property. And even when you're going from overhead to underground, uh, these trees are still going to be in the way and more, more than likely would have to be removed at that point anyway to, uh, to go to underground. So I think the more immediate solution to this is to perform tree removal and not, and not pruning. And, uh, you know, I, I just think that that's a planned, quicker solution, uh, more of a return on investment than either going underground or just continuing with the, uh, the old uh, practice of doing some, some heavy line pruning. And I just, um, I just had a couple things I just loaded down from the internet here. Sorry, got a, you know, just a copy here, but you can see where you have a full healthy tree and then they come in and, you know, they're encouraging the, the tree company to, to take half the tree away. So once again, now that tree is asymmetrical. You get a, you know, a windy uh, storm event, that tree is going to come down and take, take the, the lines with it. And I mean, you know, I just, I just did a Google search and I found this and, and this is what they're encouraging these tree clearing companies, uh, contractors to do. And once again, it's just detrimental to the trees and you're just creating a hazardous situation with trees that are basically near the, the end of their useful life as it is. So, you know, it's just, it's just a liability waiting to happen. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your input. We appreciate it. Ada? I would like to call upon Mike Strano. Please state your full name for the record. Mike Strano. Yeah, uh, I'm a resident of uh, East Amal Township, and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Mayor Wolf for providing me with the uh, email uh, concerning today's meeting. And uh, I live in East Amwell. It's been here for 60 years. And we are the last uh, residents on the line coming down our road. We're the forgotten ones on East Amwell Township. And I don't know if the board knows me by name, but I've filed numerous complaints with the Board of Public Utility over the years. There's times that I would get an answer from the board. Many times I would not receive anything from the board, which is deeply concerning. So latest um, correction that the board, oh, I'm sorry, someone talk? No, sir. No, I thought I heard something. Okay, the latest correction from the board was um, that they were putting in trip savers, um, which I believe I uh, got a response in December and they installed three trip savers out in the state highway, which is 31, comes down Linville Road, maybe half a mile, down my road, a mile and a half. So they put the trip savers on and then Christmas Eve, we lost power again. That went out till the day after Christmas. And therefore the trip savers are not working just to put it into the record. I had conversation with an engineer, hopefully Jim's listening, Foucault, uh, from JCPNL. And I explained to him concerning the trip savers and how they're not, uh, how they didn't work. And I offered once again, for him to come out, we can go up and down the road, take a look at everything. And, you know, he was hemming and hauling, I'm not sure. And, and you know, with the COVID situation, I understand. I said, well, I'm willing to, you know, drive my own vehicle, wear a mask, stay six feet away. I'm still awaiting a call back from him. So those there didn't work. And being the last customer on the road, it's not a dead end road. You go through to the other side of the road, it's public service, electric and gas. On the other side of the road, they have a lot less problems than we do. Now, two reasons, in my opinion, is vegetation is one. 60 years ago, these trees were not like they are today. And as one of the gentlemen spoke, they need to be taken down. When you go on the other side to PSE&G as well, they have much taller trees. So you can give the trees a little bit more opportunity if you so choose to let them grow, it'll still be underneath the utility line. That's a recommendation that I would put out there you know, with the brainstorming session that's going on today. Um, for the ESIAS part, well, let, let me go back to the tree trimming. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little disorganized. But uh, last year we had a tree trimming come out and we had some trees identified that were come out and do them. So they took down a few of the trees and one of the trees was too high. Here's they needed a hundred foot bucket truck so they didn't have a bucket truck. They had to wait on one or from another job. 
So what did the tree guys do for three hours? The neighbor showed me a video. They were out on a pond with ropes across the pond, sledding across the pond. And meanwhile, as someone else spoke up about paying your bill, every month you got to pay your bill, however you do it, automated or not. That's what we're paying for. There's nobody watching. There's nobody responsible to do any of it. You come out here, they just do what they have to do and move along. So let me just focus back to the original um, reason for the meeting was the Isaias storm. So August 4th, 11, 10 a.m., we get an outage. The phone system was down. Called it, talked to a Sabrina, restore time was August 4th, 2 p.m. 8.08 p.m. requested um, crew status arrived 1 a.m. Restore time was on August 5th, which was the next day. I tried to get a confirmation number, couldn't get a confirmation number. Uh, 5.20 a.m. on August 5th, call again, talk to another woman, no restore time. No updates. Uh, 1.54 on August 5th, uh, text restore time. 9 p.m. on 8.5, crew status arrived. Same day, August 5th, 9, 10 p.m., sent an email. Uh, then I get an email back on August 6th, 11, 17 a.m., majority restored, 11.30 p.m. on 11.20. On August 7th, at 8.23 a.m., I receive a text. Expect power restored majority before 8.11 at 11.30 p.m. Pending investigation is the cause. So on the 7th, again, 9.55 a.m., get a text, still no power. They cut me off. I had to call back again. They said power was restored. Call back again to get it reinstated back into the system because they said my power was restored when, in fact, it wasn't. I know Mayor Wolf had a lot of issues with it as well, and it wasn't restored. And lo and behold, I didn't get the power back till the 8th at 7 p.m. There seems to be a lot of communication problems, and it appears to be um, bad misinformation being provided um, to, to the customers, to the mayors, maybe possibly to the board. And, and I'm willing to work with anybody out there, whether it's Jim from JCPNL, the VPU, anyone who's willing to, to come out and provide you know, the service that we're paying for you know, for the safety, we need electric. You, know, you have some pumps, we buy generators, they go bad, we got to buy another generator. It's very costly, you lose the food in your refrigerator. And as someone else had said, you know, we're compensated for no losses. We just incur all those losses. And you look at what we're paying for these, these tree people to come out and to do some um, sledding or what have you on someone's pond for three hours on our dimes, that's a problem. And I reported it to the, to the, uh, you know, the utility, you know, and I, I don't know what they're doing or not, and I really don't care because that's not what it's about. But someone needs to be watching them when they come out here to actually do the work. Um, and, and then the other thing was when they come out and they do an assessment of trees and I, I try to engage them as, as often as I possibly can, everything has to do with a budget restraint. We're not allowed to do it. We can't do it because the money's not in the budget. The tree's too big, the money's not there. Well, who said that? Where's that coming from? And then the other part or the other excuse that I would receive, well, if you look at the trees, well, here's one here. It's dying. Well, it's too far off of the right of way. I, mean, I don't know what that right of way is. I'm told it's 10 feet. So if you got a 10 foot right of way and you got a tree that's, you know, 80 feet in the air, I mean, if the tree's dying and they can't go over that, that mark to get it to provide you know, safety, provide electric for everyone. I mean, what needs to be done to correct these deficiencies? And I guess, um, let me just look at my notes. Yeah, and that, okay, they, what they're claiming is that, um, I'm just looking at my notes, sorry. The, the one engineer I talked to, he says everything that, that's been done is, is in compliance with the BPU. So I guess what what is, what is required of the utility if, if what they're telling me is correct, that the BPU um, mandates or whatever the terminology would be. 
what requirements are they to do for whether it's tree removal, vegetation, whatever we want to call it. I mean, is there a requirement? What is that requirement? And you know, with, with the, the latest um, correction here as well, with the board um, satisfied with the utilities um, correction with the three trip savers that were put in. And then, like I said, I lost power Christmas Eve through the day after Christmas that the trip savers didn't work. So how do I go about getting that thing rolling again? Because the complaints that I've filed over the years, I, I could probably count on, you know, a handful that I got a response from the board back and the rest, I just have no idea whatever happened to them. They just go there and they're just gone. No response, no nothing. So just, I'm just trying to look for, for some kind of, um, um, mechanism where I can go, how I can go about it. Who do I see? What do I do to try to correct this problem? And I'm not here to, to complain or, or, or whine. I just want to get, you know, what, what we're paying for. And that's it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Strano. If you would forward your uh, address and phone number uh, to the board secretary and uh, we'll have somebody reach out to you specifically. All right. How, how do I reach her? Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, you should email her at board.secretary okay. at bpu.nj.gov. Do you want me to repeat it? Board.secretary at bpu.nj.gov. Correct, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next uh, person, Ada. I would like to call upon... Peter Malsa, please state your full name for the record. Mr. Malsa? Mr. Malsa. Next person, please, Ada. That's the end of the list. That's the end of the list. Mr. Ford, you didn't want to speak? Mr. Ford? I guess not. Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone who participated today. I, I was very helpful. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, the, uh, we have a court reporter. Uh, all of the uh, words that were spoken today have been recorded and will be reviewed by the board. And um, I would appreciate that if you have any difficulties as we move forward to please reach out to the board. And uh, we're here to work with you. We're, we're rate payers just like you. And uh, we uh, are doing, uh, much of our staff is doing a yeoman's job in, in trying to ensure the fact that uh, the lights stay on. And, uh, and having a um, event like this certainly helps us. And your suggestions today have been extremely helpful. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedules to speak with us regarding this. Uh, as I said, we will be having these quarterly meetings. Uh, so please look forward or, or stay alert to any, any uh, mention of the next quarterly meeting and uh, we'd love for you to participate uh, then also. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any closing comments? Seeing none or hearing none, uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Again, thank you all very much. Stay safe and take care of yourselves and take care of one another. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice weekend, everybody.